balance of alertness, but also a sense of ease so you're not holding tension. And just scan through your body and check those areas where you habitually hold tension, whether it's the jaw or the neck or the shoulders. Just move your awareness through your body, softening, adjusting, finding that place where the energy flows. And bring your awareness to your breathing. Just noticing what it feels like to breathe. Feeling the full inhalation and exhalation. And at the beginning of the meditation, it's good to also adjust your mental posture and just set a positive motivation that we're here to clear our minds, learn to quiet the busy chatter. And based on that, we wish to develop our minds, learn how to enhance our positive virtuous states of mind. And calm down and gradually eliminate harmful states of mind which interfere with our spiritual progress. And we do this not only for our own happiness and mental and physical well-being, but also so that we can be of greatest service and benefit to all others around us. So just come back to your breath now.
If thoughts arise, just notice thinking. Gently bring your awareness back to the moment to moment changes in the breath as it moves through your body. So we're here for a very auspicious purpose, which is to make use of our life in a meaningful way to explore our potential and develop our minds so that we can realize higher states of peace and wisdom within and then share that with others. So um, just a reminder, I don't consider myself a teacher, more of a class leader. What little knowledge and understanding I've obtained in the Dharma is only due to the kindness of my teachers, and I, I don't know if you can see, but I shared the screen of some of my teachers, um, Dalai Lama, Venerable Tipton Children, Jada Rinpoche, and uh, Yangtze Rinpoche, who uh, will be here in a couple of weeks, and many others. So um, we live at a time of great change in our world and the nature and, and uh, human society. Scientists have already drawn attention to the fact that thousands of species of animals and plants are going extinct every day. <clears throat> this era is now called the Anthropocene, acknowledging how our human industrial society is rapidly altering our world. and endangering our own survival and that of so many other living beings. There's great suffering on the planet now and great sadness at the loss of so much natural beauty in the forests and oceans that are increasingly under stress from pollution, resource extraction, overpopulation, suburban sprawl, plastic garbage, and so forth. And the only way to reverse these trends is through a peaceful revolution and what His Holiness the Dalai Lama calls a sense of universal responsibility, not focusing exclusively on our own personal happiness, but devoting our energies to birthing a new world where humans learn to live in a spirit of mutual cooperation and caring for each other. And that process begins with our own spiritual transformation. So in the first two classes, uh, we touched on our human potential, the concept of a mental continuum and rebirth, reliance on a spiritual teacher, and the concept of the Lam Rim or gradual path teachings within Tibetan Buddhism. Um, So the first three points of the Lamrim outlines are the greatness of the authors, the greatness of the teachings, and how to listen and share the teachings. So uh, for reasons of time, I'll only touch on a few points here and encourage you to do further study on your own. Lama Atisha and Lama Tsongkhapa made great sacrifices and effort to organize these teachings. And in a deeper sense, the Lam Rim orig originates from Shakyamuni Buddha, who renounced his life of luxury and pleasure as a prince, went to the forest and practiced intensively for six years before attaining enlightenment. Reading about the life stories of the Buddha and great masters deepens our understanding, our sense of devotion, and gives us the inspiration and courage to walk in their footsteps. 
Another point is that the Dharma teachings are non-contradictory, even though superficially they sometimes appear to contain inconsistencies. For example, sometimes Buddha said that the self exists, and at other times he said that the self does not exist. One needs to, under, uh, to study widely to understand the context for different teachings delivered to different audiences and thereby have the skill to apply them, not only for oneself, but for others of varying dispositions. Also, it's very important here to note that we study not simply to gain academic knowledge, to impress ourselves or others, but mainly, you know, exclusively really, to apply the Dharma to our lives so that we can transform our minds. And there are three steps in this process. First is listening to the Dharma, which includes reading, attending Dharma teachings, watching videos. Second, once we've listened, we reflect and apply the information we've heard to our own lives, examining the knowledge from many different angles and making examples from our own experience, uh, just seeing if it makes sense to us. And lastly, once we've reached a firm and direct understanding based on this process and reached a conclusion that accords with the intended meaning, we focus our minds on that conclusion with single pointed concentration to make that realization firm within. So strictly speaking, one enters the Buddhist path when one is more concerned about future lives than this life. And certainly you can get a lot of benefit from meditation and, and learning about mind and emotions. Um, but that doesn't really, um, you know, the purpose of the Buddhist path is, is um, to free ourselves. Well, I'll, I'll get to it, but, um, you know, those, those sort of basic level emotional teachings um, about learning about the mind and calming the mind, you can learn that anywhere. But, um, as a Buddhist, sort of our first level of practice is um, wanting to benefit our future lives, realizing that we're going to die. And it's important to use our time wisely now and prepare for that um, and not just sort of uh, wait and see what happens. So a couple of weeks ago, I... Um, was at a uh, interfaith conference and um, I was really quite um, impressed and felt quite uh, fortunate to be there because, um, you know, the various other faiths, Judaism, Christianity, Islam and Hinduism, um, they all have very important things to say and there's so much um, commonality among the major religions of the world about how to be a kind person basically how to um, develop your love and compassion and ethics and and so forth and um, however only buddhism in my experience um, gives very explicit teachings on wisdom and how to develop it how to develop it and here wisdom has a very specific meaning we aren't talking about the conventional wisdom that you might find in reading psychology today or or even the wisdom gained at the early stage of buddhist practice here we're talking about direct insight into the nature of reality only when we've perceived reality directly not as an intellectual idea, but as a direct experience beyond conceptual thinking. 
into the lack of inherent existence of self and phenomena, can we permanently overcome delusion, stop our rebirth via the wheel of karma and gain freedom from suffering? So that's the main purpose of the entire Buddhist path, to lead us to that, to that understanding freeing us from mental bondage and enabling us to guide others to that same lasting state of happiness. Um, and what an amazing world it would be if, if uh, everyone was free from their delusions. So to develop wisdom, we need to ac accumulate a vast collection of positive virtue or merit which infuses our practice with the spiritual potential needed to gain insight into, into reality. You know, there's, there's three uh, principal paths talked about. I mean, there's so many lists in Buddhism, but anyways, the three, the three uh, higher trainings, sorry, are ethics, con concentration, and wisdom. And each one creates a foundation for the next level. And if, if we don't have ethical discipline in our lives, when we sit down and try and meditate, our, our mind is all over the place because, you know, everybody has a conscience and, um, you know, any kind of negativity we've created is, is just kind of still resonating there in our mind. And so until we can really clean up our act and, and, uh, act in a, in a way that's virtuous and just spreads good energy, um, it's difficult to calm and quiet the mind. And until you can calm and quiet the mind, um, it's pretty impossible to understand the Buddhist wisdom teachings, which are very subtle. You know, it's a very subtle view that Buddha discovered in terms of the nature of the self and how um, the self exists. So, um, so returning to the idea of the gradual path, we built this foundation of spiritual knowledge so that wisdom can arise. And, um, and that really begins with the teaching on the precious, preciousness of human rebirth. <clears throat> so please don't misunderstand me here. Although I was born in Florida, I'm not about to um, give a, a talk about uh, the right to life. It's, it's something completely different when Buddhists talk about precious human rebirth. Um, and, um, but just a little background before I get into that, you know, right, I just read a really interesting statistic is on November 15th, world population is projected to reach 8 billion people which is more than double it was when I was born. Of those 8 billion human beings, over 1 billion are living in shanty towns without clean water, good food, jobs, or proper shelter. Hundreds of millions of other people are living in places which are affected by war, disease, climate disasters, and social upheaval. And still more people are born into extreme wealth. Well, not so many, fortunately, but their social conditioning causes them to waste their time on frivolous activities which have no deep purpose. And then there are billions more people who simply have no interest in spiritual matters, or if they do, it's, it's a part-time hobby after they've watched all their favorite shows on TV, gossiped about celebrities or just slaved away at jobs in order to survive. And, you know, there's no judgment in any of that intended. It's just, um, it's not an, not an easy life for, for a lot of people. And, you know, they come home exhausted from work, sometimes mentally traumatized, and they have to cook and clean and so forth. And unless there's some community support, it's really difficult to um, pick up a book and read about spiritual development when you're exhausted at the end of the day. <clears throat> so the eight opportunities or the eight freedoms are 
for non-human states with no chance for Dharma study and for human situations with no chance for Dharma study. And the first four um, correspond to different realms of existence, which, um, you know, again, this is, can be taken on faith or just sort of with an open mind that other existences or realms are possible. I mean, we don't really know unless um, you've had a direct experience, but, um, but if, you know, assuming that these are real, um, if you're born in a place where you're in continual pain and fear, which corresponds to the Buddhist hell realms, then it's really difficult to practice Dharma or have even one virtuous thought. And uh, frustration and clinging, that's the hungry ghost realms, the animal realm, which is basically dominated by eating, sleeping, reproducing, and avoiding being eaten by other creatures. Again, very difficult to practice. And God realms, seen as really non-physical, you know, kind of mental realms primarily with very refined states of concentration, but basically you land there after practicing deep meditation, uh, not working on the long, the big picture of developing your wisdom. And so you get into a meditation where you just blank out the mind and you can even feel quite blissful doing this. Um, but if you don't actually, you know, when you leave that state, you haven't actually purified your mind of any obstacles. You, you still have a lot of negative emotions that are temporarily suppressed when you go into deep meditation. Um, so anyways, you can get stuck in these exalted states and, and literally stay there for eons if you're born as a god and totally exhaust all your positive karma. And then once that lifetime is over, there's nowhere to go but down into the lower realms, it's said. And then the four human situations, some of the terminology is a little bit old. You know, we don't talk about barbarians anymore because that can lead to, you know, marginalizing other cultures. But basically, it, it refers to um, any place where there's uh, restrictions on civil rights and it's uh, or, you know, the practice of religion. Um, similarly, in point three, I just wrote to some of my teachers saying, hey, this outline should be updated so we don't use inappropriate terminology and refer to uh, people living with mental impairment. Um, even that's not the right term, you know, term I'm looking for. P people living who don't have full use of their faculties but you know they still have um, they still have potential. It's important to affirm and not not you know marginalize people um, with mental illness. And um, so, anyways, I'm I'm obviously still struggling with the, the correct term there. But the the point is, if if you're born and your mind your brain has um, birth effects or something that don't enable you to think clearly, it's difficult to practice the entire Dharma path. And then lastly, um, having instinctive wrong views is, is said to be one of the worst ones that's just being born. And, and, and I've witnessed this on social media, people are just complete, completely closed minded and say, you know, there's no such thing as cause and effect. And and there's no such thing as rebirth. After death, it's just light, lights out and everything will be fine and I don't have to worry about anything. So, so the 10 opportunities that humans are, you know, as a human, um, well, the first one is being born as a human, which it's said that a human has a very special energy system that's different than other beings in other realms that allows one to practice Tantra, you know, which involves moving the inner winds and, and subtle consciousness through the body. Most of these other ones uh, living in a central Buddhist region basically just means, you know, there's uh, Buddhist teachings are available here. There's teachers who come and teach. It's not someplace. Uh, I mean, where I grew up in Maine initially, there wasn't 
much Buddhism that I was aware of. I wasn't exposed to it. So, I mean, things, things change. And, and also it's important to keep in mind that, you know, the universe is a big place. Even scientists now are, are talking about the possibilities of life on another planet and, and acknowledging that you know, there's, there's a lot of possibility for life in other places, but whether or not there are teachings on, on, on um, how to fulfill your potential or not, who knows? Anyways, I'm not going to go through all these point by point, but the point is it's, it's good to look at your situation and realize um, how fortunate you are and use that as an impetus for practice. Those are the eight freedoms and 10 opportunities. And, and then comes the fourth point in the outline where almost all the Lam Rim teachings are contained. And there's several topics here to reflect on such as the benefits of being born human. As a human, we can create positive karma, take ethical precepts and observe them. And you know, taking, taking ethical precept is, some people view it as, oh, that, that sounds kind of like um, restrictive and you know, I don't wanna do that, that's, that's too religious or, you know, it, it, hinders my personal freedom or, you know, some, some reason people will come up. But um, the point of precepts is, is it's, it's a way of affirming the direction you want to go in your life. And so, you know, there's, there's five uh, basic uh, lay precepts for, for people who uh, decide to make a formal decision to become Buddhist. And, you know, the first one is, the decision that I'm not going to kill. And um, so if everybody in the world could just take that first precept, imagine how things would change, you know, that, that you're not going to kill at least. Um, I mean, there's different levels of killing, killing human being versus killing, killing, killing animals. Um, and, and people interpret those um, precepts in different ways. Um, most of the Buddhists I know now are, are um, tried, not most, but not all, you know, try to be vegetarian because of the, um, the, I mean, no animal, no, no creature wants to lose their life. Everybody, every being values their own life and doesn't like to suffer the pain of being executed. And so um, in, in any case, Taking these precepts is something we can do as a human being and create a lot of positive karma that uh, propels us on the path. And then it's important to reflect on the causes and difficulty of obtaining a human rebirth. The causes are perfect ethical discipline and prayers. In terms of the difficulty, um, there's a few different analogies, but I'll just speak of one here. Is, um, so there's a blind sea turtle that comes to the surface of the ocean every uh, 100 years, and the ocean is really turbulent. And somewhere on this ocean, there's a golden ring floating. The chances of being born human is the odds of the blind turtle putting his head through the ring. The turbulent ocean symbolizes cyclic existence. The turbulence is the force of our own delusions and karma and the blind sea turtle signifies ignorance. So from this analogy, it's clear that it's very difficult actually to be born a hum as a human. Even though we have 8 billion humans, um, right now it's vastly more insects on the planet. I mean, many orders of magnitude more and, and animals and, and so forth. So, and, and I just want to mention the, the eight worldly dharmas here, which relate to using our human life in a good way. So in Lama Sankhapa's short prayer, the three principal aspects of the path, it says, by contemplating the freedoms and opportunities so difficult to find and the fleeting nature of your life, reverse the clinging to this life. I'm still caught in the eight worldly dharmas all the time, you know, and, and thinking just about, you know, better food and clothing and shelter rather than being content with what's adequate. 
And in order to counter this attitude, we need to reflect repeatedly on death and impermanence and look at these eight worldly attitudes, worldly dharmas that as they come up. And so they're explained in four pairs of things we either crave more of or have aversion for. We want more pleasure, less pain. We like, we like to be praised, but we don't like to be blamed. We want fame or good reputation, and we don't like it when somebody uh, slanders us or speaks badly about us or gives us a bad reputation. And we like material gain and have aversion for loss. <clears throat> so once again, it's important to have a balanced view here. Um, when we look at these eight worldly concerns, it doesn't mean we disregard our welfare, our reputation, or our health. However, if we reject the reality that this life is going to be have frequent occurrences where we're disappointed by others, experience pain and so forth, then we're more likely to react with unhealthy emotions when these things happen and create karmic actions that arise out of anger, attachment, jealousy, and so forth, which not only wastes our time and creates many problems in this life, but it also creates the causes us for us to not be able to be born human again. So speaking of time, um, I talked longer than I intended and um, I'll stop here and invite your questions and or observations, thoughts, sharing. Does any of this make sense? If it's rare to be reborn as a human, like, I guess, what are you, what are you thinking of the goal to, you know, for your, for that next life? Like, it, what, you know, what, how are you surrounding the focus on those, I guess, you know, the things you like to achieve in your three high trainings, like ethics, concentration, are, are you not seeking like whatever the next like life is, but just implementing those qualities in your day-to-day -day and your thinking? We want to be born as a human again so that we can continue our practice uninterrupted because um, if, we, if we have a human birth but don't observe, don't observe pure ethics in our life, I mean, it's said according to the teachings. I don't know this for a fact, but you know, my teachers all say, um, don't count on being born as a human. And if you are born as an animal or uh, as, you know, in one of the, you know, lower realms, it's really difficult to continue your Dharma practice. And so you lose all that momentum. It's like we're trying to roll a big boulder up a hill and being a human, we're already halfway there. And the top of the mountain is liberation and enlightenment. But if we keep letting the boulder roll all the way down to the bottom of the hill each time, it's going to take a really long time. I don't know if that's helpful, but um, and did I, did I even answer your question, Shane? Yeah, you did. And I'm also thinking of some of the cases we discussed where like young children can recognize their past life. Um, <laughs> So if they're recognizing like a human past life, like that's a rarity. You know, I mean, there's, there's a part of me that sort of wonders about some of these teachings, to be honest. And, and, um, and it's difficult to accept them all literally. And, and I, I, don't, um, I don't try to say, well, it's, it's this way and you've got to believe it. It's, um, but because I can't prove it directly myself, you know, maybe that young child who remembers their past life, maybe they're just like a really amazing human being. And probably they are by the fact that they can remember their past life. But anyways, the, the point of these teachings, as I understand, is to really make us use our opportunity of this life, which is definitely going to end 
the sand is running out of the hourglass right now. And, um, and so it's all of these initial level teachings are all just a really strong encouragement not to waste our time. So I totally get your sort of logical mind that's kind of questioning, well, is, does that really make sense? You know, that, that human, you know, the human birth is so rare. There's sort of a lot of, I don't know in that answer. <laughs> Understood. Yeah, I just realized, you know, I'm sort of studying on my own. I, you know, I've been doing the FPMT I'm really dragging my feet with the, the basic program has a long rim section where it's kind of, it's more just online. There's no teachers. And I just realize I waste, you know, I can waste a lot of time. Um, and it's hard, you know, I grew up a Catholic and I really did not like, did not like that at all. It was just uh, a lot of guilt and, um, and it did not appeal to me as a child. And, you know, there's good reasons why I just left it. And um, I pursue Buddhism and it just touches my heart a lot more. Um, but I do, I, I continually try to fight against that feeling of guilt of not doing everything I, you know, and, and oftentimes with the preciousness of this human life, I, yeah, it's like, Ah, uh, gosh, I'm so lazy. Why don't I get on this and do, just, I, I need to devote all my time. Um, and when you're, you know, just kind of a late person, it's not, you know, we are caught up in things and it's not always possible. So I guess um, my question is sort of how do you balance, you know, working towards, you um, you know, working for the Dharma as opposed to just kind of getting caught up in all these worldly concerns, you know. Well, we first, deal. yeah, first just notice guilt when it arises. It's a totally pointless emotion that does not benefit you at all. And, and when you see it in your mind, when you notice that it's hanging around, um, practice some forgiveness and just say, hey, it's okay. I'm, I'm doing the best I can. And, and that's, that's all any of us can do. You know, I, yeah, that's, that's really the, uh, the essence. I mean, um, one, one other thing too, you know, is like when we talk about the lower realms in Buddhism, you know, the hell realm, and I, I didn't have much, I didn't have hardly any um, exposure to Christian teachings about hell or anything, but I, my sense is that somehow guilt gets tagged onto that, you know, you're going to go to hell. And, and there's a lot of probably misunderstanding within Christianity too. Um, but within Buddhism, there's no sense of like, oh, you're a bad person, you're going to go to hell. It's just, um, you know, Buddha has, has compassion for everybody. That's, that's what I'm trying to develop. And when I see doing bad things, I try to differentiate between the person and the action, not see anybody as a bad person and not, you know, sort of admonish them and keep some sort of blame or, um, or anger, you know, directed at them because of, because of their actions. Because I understand if they really, you know, their basic, at their basic core, everybody has this Buddha nature, this, this pure mind that, that is afflicted with negative emotional habits. And so we all have that potential within us. And, and you know, sometimes our own negative emotions and, you know, laziness is like a habit that comes up for me too. And, and it's very easy. We're, we're quite conditioned in Western culture to keep guilt upon ourselves. Oh, I'm a terrible practitioner. I, I don't study hard enough. I'm no good at this, that, or the other thing. And that's just a um, really uh, unskillful negative mental conditioning that we've been exposed to. And, and this is all part of the Buddhist path is just developing mindfulness. What's going on in our mind? What are we, what are we feeding ourselves with on a moment to moment basis and, and try and pull out by the root, all of those um, unhelpful habits and, and just have immense patience and forgiveness and love for ourselves when we 
come up short sometimes. Well, it's wonderful to practice with you. Thank you for, for being here, for your questions and your meditation practice. So just gathering up all this good energy we've created together and really rejoicing that we were able to spend some time working on ourselves, developing our mental potential, investigating about what, what we can do with our lives and trying to create a positive environment, internal spiritual environment so that we can live our lives in a good way and benefit all the people that we come in contact with now and in the future through all our lives.